So you're planning to insulate your old house or building, either to increase thermal comfort, improve energy efficiency, maybe you're being forced to improve energy performance by your city or local jurisdiction, or maybe it's a combination of these reasons. But insulating an old building can be tricky, as you are fundamentally changing the way that it's performed for the last hundred plus years, and in fact, insulating and sealing buildings the wrong way can actually lead to their rapid degradation. We've covered this before in other videos, which we'll link up here and in the description below, but in this video, we're talking about what you need to know before you decide to insulate and seal your building, how different construction methods, climate, and building conditions impact your insulation strategy, and discuss cases where insulating is not a good solution. Let's get into it. When determining how to insulate any building, one of the first things that we look at is climate. Is it a warm climate, a temperate climate, or a cold climate? Is it dry or wet? How much precipitation does the area receive each year? Is it a coastal climate? What is the average snow load? Is it a windy site? Even elevation plays a role, as high elevation sites have a tendency to have higher UV exposure. All of these factors play a significant role in the way that we insulate a building, both in new construction and renovations, but it can especially inform how we approach an insulation retrofit. If we have a cold, wet climate and we want to insulate an old, solid masonry building, we're going to have concerns about efflorescence and spalling from freeze-thaw damage if we insulate from the interior side and are not properly shedding water on the exterior with flashings, drips, building geometry, and other architectural elements. Freeze-thaw damage occurs when the masonry gets saturated with water and when temperatures get cold enough to where water freezes within the masonry, leaving behind concentrations of mineral salts. Then, when temperatures warm up, water rushes to dilute those salt concentrations, creating a buildup of osmotic pressure, which can exert enough force to cause the surface of the brick to crumble, deteriorating the building over time with each freeze-thaw cycle. So, what does insulating have to do with this? Well, if we insulate from the interior side, that masonry wall is going to stay colder because it'll receive less heat flow since it's not thermally coupled to the interior anymore. It's also going to stay wetter for the same reasons, since drying requires energy. We also have to be concerned about condensation in these colder climates when we insulate from the interior. For the last hundred years or more, the interior surface of that masonry wall was more or less around the same temperature as the interior, perhaps a little colder if it was covered in lath and plaster, but within a reasonable temperature range. But if we filled the interior framed wall with insulation, that masonry wall is going to stay colder, and the moisture generated from the interior condition space can end up condensing on the back side of the masonry if we don't have some form of condensation control in place. And usually our condensation control is going to be the type of insulation that we use. We can't use all insulation types because some are vapor permeable, others are air permeable, and some are air and vapor permeable. We don't want to trap moisture, but we also don't want to allow it to move completely unrestricted. So you can see that there's a balance here that we need to respect. Let's talk a second about building geometry and how architectural elements of the building can impact how and if a building should be insulated. These various architectural details on this masonry building look decorative at a first glance, but they're actually quite functional in terms of shedding rainwater. Windows are inset, the window sills are single-piece lugged sills that extend past the wall and have kerf cuts on the underside to break surface tension to keep water away from the building. The architectural elements above and around the window divert water away. The cornice details also help to keep water away from the building. The coining on the building corners are composed of higher quality, less porous stone, which is important since it's the building corners that receive the highest level of exposure. Overall, a building like this manages water extremely well. We can also take a look at how an old wood-framed home manages water. Deep overhangs, porches to protect the first floor windows, simple roof forms with a slightly steeper pitch. Homes like these were not challenged by water because they used building geometry and the architecture to their advantage, and if they did get wet, they dried out quite easily. If you construct stuff out of wood, it needs to be a lot more protected than a building constructed out of multi-wythe masonry since the masonry can soak up a lot more water and it's not going to rot out. Let's also take a look at some bad examples. These buildings lack the proper flashings and architectural elements to shed water away from the building. You can see the staining on the building and efflorescence. Again, it's those mineral salts that we're talking about. We don't want to insulate a building like this until we've addressed these issues, otherwise we can run into the problems that we've discussed. We have to deal with the moisture before we deal with the insulation. 
Wooden components that are embedded in masonry can also pose a high risk of moisture damage if the walls are insulated from the interior, even if you use the right type of insulation. The masonry wall wicks water into those embedded joist ends via capillarity. When we insulate that wall, we get less heat flow and the embedded ends stay wetter for longer, increasing the risk of deterioration. Now, if you're in a dry climate, this might not be a problem. If you're in a wet climate, this is a big problem since that masonry wall is constantly absorbing and storing moisture, and so we either need to cut the joists away from the masonry to bear on new bearing points, like steel angles that are bolted to the masonry wall to a new interior bearing wall, or we can treat the embedded ends with borates and try to warm them up using radiant heating. The latter solution may require moisture monitoring, and it's a good idea to take moisture content measurements as close to the embedded ends as possible prior to insulating to determine how wet these joists are. Now we should mention that temperature will have an impact on your readings since colder air generally has a higher relative humidity and wood increases in moisture content with relative humidity. If you're looking for a guide to retrofitting an existing home with insulation and improving energy performance without compromising durability, get my guide to moisture management for residential remodels in which we discuss how to safely insulate and address a wide range of existing building conditions. That's only available at asiri-designs.com shop. Now back to the video. Now let's talk about roofs and particularly parapet walls. This video is sort of masonry focused, but in a lot of cases we're still dealing with wood framed roof assemblies and where they tie into exterior walls or parapets. Now we do have two other videos on our channel about insulating existing roof assemblies and attics and the various design considerations that you need to know. We'll put links to those up here and in the description below. But just a brief overview, many of these same principles and considerations that we discussed for walls also apply to roof assemblies. The first and number one priority is always water management. If we have active leaks in the roof, we cannot insulate whatsoever, and we need to prioritize fixing those leaks and repairing the roof as soon as possible. That comes number one, and there's no compromising on this. If you have a limited budget and you can only afford to re-roof or insulate, choose the re-roof. Heating your building a little bit more is going to cost significantly less than a mold or rot remediation. Now the problem is, we don't always know if there's an active leak, especially if the leak is small enough to where it's been drying out. You'll want to look for patterns of water staining, and even go into your attic during a rainstorm to observe areas where you suspect that there could be some water intrusion. If the current roof is old enough, sometimes it's better just to start from a blank slate and include the re-roof as part of the scope of work. We also need to worry about condensation, but even more so in our roofs, since all of the moisture-laden air has a tendency to end up in the attic due to the stack effect and hygric buoyancy, and we either need to vent the roof or design the roof as an unvented system, and this will ultimately depend on the roof form that you're working with. Some roofs are not possible to vent if they have complex forms with multiple intersecting gables and dormers, and or if you'd like to have a conditioned attic space. This is an example of what not to do. This was an insulation retrofit of an old masonry row house. Flat roof above, large interstitial space created by the roof framing and the ceiling joists below, embedded structural components, no venting, and no insulation above the roof deck. When we fill this entire space with blown-in insulation, the risk of condensation is extremely high because the roof sheathing is pretty close to the outdoor temperatures. It's thermally isolated from the interior, and the roof membrane is vapor impermeable. The blown-in insulation is both air permeable and vapor permeable, and so moisture just passes right through the insulation unrestricted. This doesn't even meet code, but insulation retrofits like these are being conducted all over the United States. Now, if you wanted to insulate this roof assembly only from the interior side, it would need to be designed specifically as an unvented roof, and you would need to use closed cell spray foam to provide your condensation control. Now, this doesn't always work either, especially if the foam cracks due to building movement, especially if the moisture content of the wooden components that you're applying it to are on the higher end. The safest way to insulate would be to insulate from the exterior of an assembly like this. Low sloped roofs with masonry parapet walls can be especially tricky to deal with. Parapets in general are one of the most complex building conditions that we have to work with due to their nature, but masonry parapets are especially challenging because the masonry wall absorbs and stores water, and when the sun hits the surface of that masonry, vapor is driven inwards, but it hits the back side of the roof membrane. 
The roof membrane, which is usually modified bitumen, TPO, EPDM, PVC, are very strong vapor retarders. We can't dry through them, and so water gets trapped behind here, which can form water blisters beneath the membrane and water intrusion on the interior side, and that's where we can even see water dripping down the backside of parapet walls, rotting out the interior framed cavities. On top of it, if you have embedded rafters, you can expect those to rot out pretty quickly. At these masonry parapet walls, we have to uncouple the parapet from the roof membrane that laps up the backside. And the best way to do that is with some sort of dimple sheet or dimple board and a vented counter flashing to allow moisture to vent out to avoid challenging the membrane. There's some great products from our friend Bob Kelly at Wickwright. He has a whole system designed specifically for these types of applications. We'll put links to those in the description as well. So as you can see, a lot of different considerations that we need to be thinking about before we decide to insulate and air seal our 100 year old buildings. Now obviously there's no way that we could fit all of the various design considerations into one video, but go and check out all the other videos that we have on addressing existing buildings and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.